Wow, we're so happy you decided to join us today. This is wonderful. Um, I'm Dave Maiulo. I run uh, this facility, and I've been running this facility for about 33 years now. And what I get to do, they actually, they actually pay me to come in and play and build toys all day long, <laughs> which we then use in our physics classes. You can see a lot of the evidence for, from behind us, what I've been doing for 33 years, and what we had out there uh, at, for you to play with before the show even started, right? So. Um, did you meet some really smart young people out there? Yes. Yeah. Isn't it wonderful that they are so bright and so engaged in science? Yeah. Yeah. So I want to bring them out, and I want you to give them a big round of applause as a thank you. Come on in, team. Come on in, team. They are my students who uh, work with me all semester it. long, and they give me lots There's and lots right of hope there. for the future, right? There's lots of reasons to be kind of depressed about the future. But you know what? Working with these smart young people gives me lots and lots of hope because I know how smart they are, how much they can actually solve, and I'm hoping that we inspire more people to come and work. And if you want to come to Rutgers later on, I see some kids here now. You come to Rutgers later on, and you want to join that team. You come and see me, because I'll put you to work, too. And you can do the same kind of thing right there, all right? Thank you, smart young people. You guys all right? You guys are great. Now, uh, before we get started, um, I just want to warn you. There will be some loud noises during the show. We'll warn you when those happen, OK? Because I know there's some kids here. And I want to also tell you that everybody should have a pair of these. Does everybody have a pair of these? We're going to look around later on before we use them in the show, but just hold on to them or we'll use them later on in the show. All right, those are important. Did everybody get one of these? Okay, what these are, this is a list of all the people that you, if you like what we see here today, what, what I'd love it if you could do is just tell the people that are on this list here that what we're doing is worthwhile. Really. Be, really, because if they learn from you that what we're doing is worthwhile, that's going to mean a lot to the fact that they'll support us and keep us, allowing us to do this more for future years, okay? So let them know, because most people only do one thing, what? They complain, right? <laughs> don't, if you don't like what you see, don't tell them anything, okay? <laughs> so but there you go. Tell us. Tell us, yes. Tell us so we can fix it. <laughs> now, without further ado, Mark Croft over here. Oh, there you okay. Hi, I'm Professor Mark Croft. I'd like to uh, welcome you here on behalf of Rutgers in the Physics Department. Uh, I'll be sort of the straight guy here. Uh, <laughs> they make fun of once in a while. Sure. Uh, and the students always enjoy it when something bad happens to a professor. <laughs> Nothing bad will happen to me. Uh, we don't know that. We <laughs> I'm, we're, we're pretty sure of it. Uh, but it is a privilege for you to come and I can share, then share, we can all share the uh, excitement of science and the love of science. Okay, so we organize this uh, like a physics course. Uh, there will be a test at the end, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so the first of the laws that we'll talk about is Newton's uh, first law, an object at rest tends to stay at rest sort of like my wife talks about me on the sofa in the house. Uh, and an object in motion tends to stand well. We'll get to that in a second. So here are some objects that are at rest. My wife's finest china, of course. And if I pull this out from underneath fast enough, I should get a face full of plates, and the law of inertia should keep these guys on the table. <laughs> Next Thanksgiving, you can no, no, it's not true. <laughs> uh, okay, that's the law of inertia, object rest. Now, the second one is the objects in motion tend to stay in motion. And now this is a really uh, profound law because it was very difficult for the ancients to realize this. Uh, for an object to be put into motion and to stay in motion, you always had to keep pushing on it. That was the way they saw it. Okay, it's sort of like my wife sees me with getting work done around the house. <laughs> uh, so, but this, this one, uh, we now have an air puck, and we can see what Newton realized, that an object in motion tends to stay in motion in a straight line, uniform motion. So not only do objects at rest tend to stay at rest, but objects in motion tend to keep the same state of motion, always moving at the same speed in the same direction. Something that was not so easy before that. 
all that, this will save this for the. Now the next one uh, is Newton's uh, second law, and that's force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, of course, if you have uniform motion, constant speed, then a change in speed is the thing that measures whether something's pushing or pulling a force. And so here I have a very low mass object. Mass is the object's tendency to put up or resist at changing its speed. But so if I hit this guy, it shoots off there at a very high speed because it has a low mass. And uh, this is a little heavier, and so if I hit it, it goes a little bit faster. And then I have a piece of lead right here that has lots and lots of mass. It's so heavy, it resists mightily any change in its speed. It hardly moves at all. As a matter of fact, its inertia is so much that I can put it on my hand, and I can beat on my hand, and it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> okay. There's one other thing. It wasn't one of Newton's laws. But so Newton knew about, from previous workers, about lodestone and magnetism. And these are buzz magnets. Sometimes they call snake egg magnets or something like that. You can, they rattle nicely. They're nice, safe magnets. And they're rather powerful. But they taught, magnets taught Newton, I believe, uh, one very, very important thing. Everything we've seen so far, I had to push on it physically. I had to touch it. But it, if you put two of these guys together, they feel each other some distance away. This is one of the really profound things in physics, action at a distance. Something here affects something over there, okay? So that's one of the, that's one of the important things in physics that you can see with magnets. If you want to bring your children up on magnetism, magnetformers are very nice because you can make interesting geometrical shapes which Kepler tried to make a universe out of. He was dead wrong, of course, but that, that's okay. Uh, he was kind of mystical in the shapes, and if you do it r properly, which I didn't. <laughs> if you do it properly, you can make a dodecahedron. I'll, you can check, uh, it's on the internet, they're doing it the right way. <laughs> I didn't practice beforehand. So, okay. we know force is equal to mass times acceleration, so I'm going to use this right here. What's this? A bowling, a bowling ball. Are bowling balls big and massive? Yeah. yeah, they are, right? They're nice and heavy. You hit, hit the table, you know it has lots of mass. What's that bowling ball attached to? Is that a big, heavy rope? No. no, that's just a light little string. And if there's anything you get out of our show at all, it really is that human beings are scientists all the time. We really are. We are naturally scientists. So I want you to tell me, as scientists, can I pick up that heavy bowling ball with a light little string? Yeah. Maybe. Do you put maybe on tests? No. <laughs> yes or no? Do you hear different answers? Yeah. yeah, and you know what? That building next door where all the physicists are sitting in their office, they're arguing all the time too. Yeah. Right, they do that all the time. But what do they do to find out what's going to happen? Yeah. Test it. Do the experiment. That's how you really, really, really learn in life. So let's do the experiment. And if I move slowly, I can move that bowling ball right off the surface of the table. Now, I don't want you to do this now, but later on, I want you to do this. You go, hey Siri, what's a jerk? Really? Because a jerk is actually a physics term. It means a change in acceleration. And if I'm the jerk up here and I pull really hard on the string, what's going to happen to the string? And you kind of know this because you've done similar things all your lives. That's what a scientist knows, right? They, from experience. But think about the physics. If force is equal to mass times acceleration, the higher the acceleration, the more the force. That's the physics. Three, two, one, and it breaks every time. But let me ask, when do you do that experiment? When you do it. When do you do it? <laughs> you actually do it a couple times a day, you really do. Because this right here is the exact same experiment. <laughs> What's this? Toilet. Toilet paper, you want some squares, you pull how? Nice and slow. You get enough squares, what do you do? 
It's the same experiment. Do we really have to explain this one? <laughs> I'm a little worried about the audience, you guys. All right. Now, there's a third law of motion. The third law of motion tells me this. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Oh, I have to do a balloon first. Oh, I'll let oh, you do yeah. that. And you know what? Oh, okay, well, you do this first. Let me, I'll, I'll let you do the balloon. Okay. Right here, we got this pretty red cart, okay? And you know that cart's not moving. I'm not moving, but I can press on the surface of the cart really hard. Again, I'm pushing down hard. The, car, the cart's pushing back on me, but there's no motion here, right? But this law and rule actually does give us motion. Uh, do you want to do it? You no, can you do it with the balloon. The, okay, okay. The, uh, this, this is a little bit like a balloon. Here, a balloon, this is Newton's third law, which is a real sleeper. For every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. One thing pushes one thing, and it, it pushes the other one in the other direction. So. <laughs> You're getting stronger balloons every yeah, year. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, now <laughs> I have a two-part system. I have the air in the balloon. I have an elastic balloon. And if I let go of it, the air gets pushed in one way by the balloon, but the air then pushes the balloon in the opposite direction, and you can see that it goes like a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's try that same experiment in another way. What's this right here? No, this is a fire extinguisher filled with lots and lots of carbon dioxide under very high pressure. There's lots of force in this fire extinguisher. I'm going to take all the force in this fire extinguisher and I'm going to hit that sail right there with all that force. Now, mm -hmm. as scientists, I want you to tell me, what direction is my cart then moving? That way, right? That way? I see hands going everywhere. Remember, there's no grading here today. All right? It's not even pass fail. You can say anything you want. No one is going to judge you. Let's do a physics survey. Who says I go that way? Me. Be brave. Who says I go that way? Fantastic. Who says I go this way? <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> Who knows I'm going that way? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. well, sooner or later, not today. By the way, remember we were telling about those loud noises? Well, this is one of those really loud noises, so especially you here in front, you may want to cover your ears, all right? So let's see what direction I go in, okay? Three, two, one. Which way did I go? Nowhere. Nowhere. The only thing that happens is your butt gets really cold. That's it. Goes right down your pants. <laughs> Now why? You saw and heard how much force I put on that sail, but there's no actual motion. But of course not. You do not push on yourself and go into motion. That's not how this law and rule works. In fact, if I'm on a skateboard, how do I get the skateboard to move? I push on the ground, right? Push on someone standing next to me. Do I push on myself? No. no. Hey, do rockets have sails? No. no, rockets don't have sails. What do we do to this rocket cart to really make it a rocket cart? Take the sail off of it. And now we have an astronaut right here. <laughs> He's going to sit on our rocket cart. What direction is this cart now going to go in? That way, right? It's obvious which way a rocket goes. But let me ask you this. You see, we have Kyle right behind Mark with that sail now. He's holding it behind him. Does he have to be there for the cart to go forward? No, there's nobody in outer space standing behind rockets. It's a lousy job to have, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's the job we gave Kyle right there, okay? Yeah, yeah. Let's okay. see some rocket motion in action. Uh, okay. <laughs> now. <laughs> In my younger years, I used to do the balloon demonstration, and of course the students are bored because they really don't like it unless the professor is in danger, uh, or better yet, hospitalized. Uh, so I came up with the following demonstration. This is the way I used to do Thank it you. in the old days. You can go and hit it. I used to gather my courage up for this, and I am on roller skates there. That's a that's a fifty pound fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> the corners were the tough part. <laughs> no, it's not empty. It's, no. it's going. Now, 
Now, when you're young and foolish, I was even younger and foolisher than this at one point, because when I first did this one uh, in the uh, 114, it had a rug floor, and I had a little fire extinguisher, I had an old pair of roller skates, and nothing happened. <laughs> and I got so angry, I came back the next time with a new pair of roller skates, racing skates, a uh, 50 pound fire extinguisher, and so if you, you know, if you plot, physicists like to plot like common sense versus time. You're born, it gets better and better, maybe it goes down a little bit in the teenage years, but then it goes better again. I went to zero <laughs> because I got up on a table to get off the rug floor. And when I got up on the table, I discovered the following. If you don't blow it between your legs on your center of mass, it sets you into rotation. In addition, so I blew myself off that table, rotating and translating. Uh, I learned a lot of physics in that short period of time. <laughs> now back to our rule of force is equal to mass times acceleration. You know, sometimes in science, we actually as scientists take things away in order to really understand them. Really, you ask a fish, hey fish, how is the water? The fish says what? What are you talking about? Why? The fish is always in what? The water, they don't really understand the question. And I ask you, how heavy is the air pressing down on your body right now? And you look at me and you say it's, I don't feel anything, right? Yeah. But there's actually a whole lot of force from the air all around us all the time. So what we gotta do is we gotta take the air away so that you can see how much force is there. But we're not gonna take the air out of the whole room, no. <laughs> we're just gonna take all the air out of this really long tube right here. What I have right here is a vacuum pump. I've now evacuated all the air out of this long tube. On one side of this long tube, I have this. What's this? Ping pong. Ping pong ball. Ping pong ball, very light and fluffy piece of plastic, hardly any mats. What's on the other side of this long tube? Yeah. Three cans, three soda cans. They're empty, but those soda cans are made of what? Yeah. Metal, right? Like piece of plastic, metal cans. But here's our experiment. Now that all the air is out of this long tube, I'm gonna take a razor blade, really sharp. I'm gonna puncture the side of the tube right there. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The force of the air that's pressing down on your bodies right now is gonna re-enter the tube on that side. That force will accelerate the ping pong ball down the tube. And when the ping pong ball leaves the side of the tube, the ping pong ball will be going 700 miles an hour. Yeah. That's how much force of air is on you all the time. So think about it in that context. But what's right here? Yeah. What's gonna happen to the cans? I say we find out. By the way, two things about this experiment. It's an extremely loud noise. So if you're scared of loud noises, cover your ears. Two, I dare you to see the ping pong ball move through the tube. It happens that fast, all right? 700 miles an hour is a high velocity. Three, two, one. What has happened? What has happened? Anybody see the ball? Pretty tough, right? This right here is soda can number one. A hole right through. What was it made from? A ping pong ball, right? Soda can number two. Right? It went through two soda cans, and you know what? These Coke cans are real tough. Sometimes I'm going to go through all three. But you know what? Hey, we're not playing ping pong anytime soon, right? So there you go, force is equal to mass times acceleration. Wait, wait one second, I just sure. wanted to emphasize, there's another way of thinking about this also, and that push of force acted over a certain distance. It pushed all along there, and it gave the ball energy of motion. <laughs> Lots of energy of motion that turned into energy of destruction. We'll talk about that more later. Yeah, oh yeah. Actually, it's a little bit difficult to work in. <laughs> you can ask quickly. Why don't, like, why, why don't like, uh, spaceships just make a giant vacuum tube? Because there's a vacuum out there already, right? So. Yeah, well, they can't it, use it. We'll talk about that after the show. How's that? Yeah, yeah. If you ask me after the show, I'll explain that. Okay. Okay, now we've been talking about things going in one dimension, and that's a nice way to start. It's nice and simple. Uh, we're going to talk, talk about things going in a circle for a little bit, and uh, for that I like this little pumpkin on a string, because there's only one thing I can do with a string and this pumpkin is I can pull on it on a line directly pointing towards my hand. 
I, I can't make it go like this. I can't like this, uh, like this, or anything. I can't push it into the floor. I can only pull on it. So if I hold it up here, I will jiggle my hand around a little bit to get it started in motion and to compensate for friction. But if I swing it around, basically the force is always pulling towards the center. That's what makes the thing go in a circle. So I'm exerting a force on it, but it's going into changing the direction of motion, not the speed. And then if I let go of it, it's like David and Goliath. This is a sort of a sling that David used. I should be able to make it, I can't think I can hit Dave. I'm not that accurate. <laughs> but you notice when I let go, it traveled in a straight line because I stopped exerting a force on it. Now, now here's another force and mass and acceleration one, right? Let's see what we got here. There you go. And that allows me to fill this wine glass with champagne. How are we going to cap it? Oh, we finished the wine. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't you worry about that. Uh, but now I have right here a very flat tray. And I'm going to put that wine glass right in the center of the flat tray. And I'm going to give this to Mark. Because can Mark now do the same thing with that that he did with that ball? They, they'd like me to do this demonstration. <laughs> they'd like me to do this demonstration because I'm not very good at it. <laughs> and they'd like to see me get wet. <laughs> you shouldn't have sat in the front row, guys. <laughs> There's only one problem. He doesn't know how to stop. <laughs> I didn't know how to stop. I got over, I got carried away. No drink for me today. There we go. There we go. Sometimes I actually manage to get it stopped. There you go. So, no, we got you that guys one. okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Want a glass of wine? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you start with energy? Oh, yes, my lacrosse stick. There you go. Okay, we talked about energy. That is energy of motion. You know, if I had a lacrosse ball and I was to take a wind up like you do in lacrosse and you throw it really hard, you give the ball a lot of energy of motion, right? But if I just drop it from here, say right here, it drops a very short distance, but it gets energy of motion from where it started. So it drops down, the earth pulls it towards it, and it gets some energy of motion from gravity. Now, if I hold it higher, will it have more energy of motion or less when it hits the floor? More! So it does have more energy of motion when it hits the floor. So that means there must be something to do with energy of position that gets tra converted into energy of motion. Okay, so there's potential energy and then there's energy of motion. Sometimes I'll call it kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is when you jiggle around a lot or when you move fast, okay? <laughs> so there's both of these types of energy, but the sum of the two, I think we go to the pendulum right you away. Do that right away? Um, yep. A pendulum is a classic, you might want to put on the, a pendulum is the classic example of this. I'll put that right up. Okay. Ray, could you put on that camera? You have to realize I have one artificial knee and that the other knee is now worse than the artificial one. <laughs> okay. So I go up here and now this object has lots of energy of position, right? And if I let go of it, it goes into energy of motion and there's a brick on the screen down there, and that goes like those Coke cans into energy of destruction. Okay, so this is a great deal of energy of motion that you get out of this. But if I start off with this, okay, let me get this right. <laughs> I'll start off with it in my nose. On my nose, yeah, in my nose, you're right. <laughs> on my nose. And any time it gets back to the same height, the total energy is the same, so it should come to rest any time it comes back to my height. And so I can let go of it against my nose, and there it goes, zero energy of motion, and now it's like, oh, stop my nose! <laughs> 
I believe in conservation of energy, but I, I always worried about my leaning forward a little bit too much. My nightmare scenario was that I often in class used to do this demonstration by myself, in which case I would hold on to the thing as I climbed the ladder, and I always imagined I'd fall off the ladder sometime and be just getting up and it would catch me on the way back. <laughs> Okay, what are we up to? You got all those guys up here now. Oh, okay. Uh, energy of motion and converting it, converting energy of motion to energy of position and back and forth. You've seen the pendulum. Now I want to emphasize to you that the transfer of energy from energy of position to energy of motion happens on a regular time scale for a given system. And here, here is the pendulum. Here are two different pendulums, just like the one we used here. And you see it's, this one is a long pendulum, and this one's a short pendulum. And you see the time that goes back, it goes position, position, motion, position, motion, position, motion. I can't say it fast enough for this one, okay? Because the short one has a very rapid change between position and energy of position and energy of motion. This is the basis for a pendulum clock like Galileo designed uh, when he discovered the properties of pendulums. You can also do it with springs. A spring with a heavy weight converts back and forth between energy of stretching of the spring and compression of the spring uh, with long times whereas the one that has a small mass does it really rapidly. So there's always a character, and the, your watches that used to be uh, spring wound were based upon that. Uh, so that's, that's the natural motion. In other words, if I have a spring and an object, I start it any way I want. It has a certain natural way it likes to ring. One, two, three, that's the time or the frequency with which it moves or converts energy. Well, suppose I try and make it move at a, uh, with a, or on a time that doesn't match up to what it likes to move at. If I wiggle it really fast, it hardly responds at all. It ignores me. If I move it very slow, it also ignores me. But if I move at just the same right frequency where it tickle it, where it likes to laugh, just the right frequency, I can build up the oscillation. Again, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon it gets so big it scares me. <laughs> <laughs> now it's the holidays, right? Yeah. So we're going to do the same thing with one of these. What's one of these? It's a wine glass. And kids, it's the holidays, so that means your parents might bring you out to one of those really good restaurants, right? A little celebration. And these glasses, when you sit down, will be on the table in front of you. But the waiter knows you're too young to have any wine, so what's the waiter going to do? Take, take that glass away. They'll wander on over, take that glass right off the table like that. Don't let this happen, okay? <laughs> Instead, take your hand, put it at the bottom of the wine glass, hold it nice and tight, right against the table. Take your fingers, put them right in your dad's water glass like that. <laughs> and then take a wet finger and just rub the top of the glass. And you're now tickling that glass just at the right so it now resonates too. It gives you that nice, pretty sound. But what's the best part of this experiment? You're going to be bugging your parents. <laughs> right? They're going to be like, knock it off. Then you're bugging everybody in the restaurant and say, hey, I'm doing physics. This is going to go on all night long. Right? <laughs> And who else is going to hear the sound? The waiter, right? And the waiter's going to come on over and say, hey, you can't do that in my restaurant. This is a quiet restaurant. And you say, hey, waiter, I got a question for you. If I take the rest of my dad's water and I fill the wine glass, do I have a higher tone or a lower tone? Lower. Lower. He sounds just like the waiter. <laughs> what are we going to get? Lower. What do we do to find out? Test it. That's what all good scientists do. And if I test it now, it's actually a lower resonant frequency. And it's a lower resonant frequency because you have the density of the water mixing with the density of the wine glass, giving you a lower resonance. And even, you can now see the sound waves dancing in the top of the water, which is fun. But even better, you can still be bugging your parents, all right? So have fun <laughs> in your next restaurant. Now we look down inside this box over here. And in this box, we have a beaker. And I can make this beaker ring 
The same way I made that wine glass ring. But I'm making it ring with sound. But you don't see anything happen here. And you really shouldn't just believe what I say. You really shouldn't just believe what anyone says, right? You should ask for some proof. So I'm going to turn on that light and turn off that light. And I'm going to turn off all the lights in the room. Because when I do this, and now give that sound back into the beaker, if you watch the beaker up there, you'll know we're shaking that beaker. We're moving that beaker quite violently. We're right at the resonant frequency of the beaker. What happens if I give that beaker too much sound energy? Oh, Would you like to see that? Yeah. You're all good scientists. Three, two, one. Breaks every time, just like that. Sound energy is very, very powerful. There you go. Do you want to do this one or skip? Oh, no, go ahead and do it. Okay. Uh, you can also tickle aluminum rod. I have some rosin on my fingers. <laughs> yeah? Is that one can you just do that with a normal You can do it with anything. You can shake anything apart if you hit it at a resonant frequency with enough. You hit it with, they have to hit it with a very, very precise frequency, okay? And almost nobody can tune it just right for a precise frequency. That's why we have Dave do all the tough stuff. <laughs> uh, okay, now this is an aluminum rod, just a plain old aluminum rod, but if I tickle it, by, it should ring. at a natural frequency. Now watch this. Okay, that's because it's this situation right here where I held it here and it doesn't vibrate there. It doesn't vibrate here so I can switch my grip to the here, but when I grab it in the middle, it has to be vibrating lots and I kill it off because it's absorbed into my hand. If I hold it right in the middle, okay, we'll do that with this one. Yeah. Let me put a little more uh, rosin on. And this is just violin rosin. And by the way, anybody can do this. You get yourself an aluminum rod, a little violin rosin, and you can make the rod sing too. Yeah, just have to hold it in rod. the right spot and rub it in the right so spot. So now this should be a longer wavelength. It should be a lower frequency. But I have here a styrofoam cup. And this is also a speaker. That's why speakers are shaped in this fashion. It's an efficient way of getting sound energy into the air. That's what you got. So this is just like playing a violin. It's the only musical instrument I can play. <laughs> All right, so we want to do some propagating waves? Sure. Let's do a propagating wave. What I got right here is a long, long rope slinky. We're going to give one end to Mark, and Mark's going to move way down over there. I'm basically a brick wall. He this. is. He is, in many ways. <laughs> so, I got this rope slinky. I'm going to pull on it. You see we have some tension on the slinky. It's really not moving too much, but I can give it some energy. I'm going to give it a karate chop. I do that, and you see you get a propagating wave across that rope slinky. You can see that it actually moves back and forth quite fast, right? Well, that's that wave energy first moving towards Mark and then moving back towards me, okay? And it's a propagating wave, okay? Because it moves right across that slinky. That's why we discuss it in that fashion. Well, here we have a device that we can have a little bit of fun with. Because what I got right here is this. What's this? A garbage can, right? A garbage can. What's this garbage can have on one side? Oh, hey, what's it have right over here? big slab of rubber, and more than anything else, this garbage can is like a big drum, and I can hit the bottom, and some of you here may feel something, all right? All right? I'm not calling anyone of you liars. You're not liars, okay? That's not what this is about. You there and back, did you feel anything? No, and if I were to turn around right now and say, look, I know you didn't see anything, I know you didn't feel anything, but just believe me, I felt something. Do you really have to believe what they say? <coughs> no. You don't want to just believe what people tell you, right? Do you believe what you see on Facebook anymore? <laughs> no. Do you believe what people put on Twitter? No, don't do that stuff, right? You don't want to do that. You want some evidence of things. So you know what? We're going to have a little evidence because sometimes in science we see action at a distance. We do this a lot in astronomy. And you know, Kyle here has a candle. And what I can do with that candle, 
or blow the candle out. So now you all know that something's going on, but you still don't see exactly what's going on with our garbage can. So what I'm now going to do is put a little theatrical fog inside this garbage can. Now theatrical fog is this blistering that we heat up, it becomes a fog. They put glycerin in most of your food, they just don't tell you, so don't worry about this. <laughs> but what I'm going to do now is happening every single time I hit this. You just didn't see it. And this to me is one of the reasons why science is so much fun. What is that? Yeah, that's a smoke ring, right? And I can aim it, right? Like this. You want to build one now? Go ahead, that's what science really is all about, build one. It's a garbage can. We'll send one up to our camera. Now, what shape is that? A circle. A circle. What shape is that? So I'm gonna take the square, I'm gonna put it right here on the front of our garbage can. Scientists, what are we gonna see now? Sparkles. Hearts. How about a rhombus? What are we going to see? What do we do to find out? Try it. Are you curious? Human beings should be curious. We're really good about being curious. So let's go ahead and put more fog in here. What are we going to see? Place your bets with some money from your neighbors because the only stable shape is the smoke ring. Smoke squares are like unicorns. You want them to be real, but they don't exist. Sometimes in life, things don't exist. Now, why do you only get the smoke rings and not the smoke squares? You already know why. You ever blow yourself a soap bubble? What shape floats away? The circle. That's where the forces are bound. You ever see a cube float away? No, and you're not going to either. The forces aren't balanced, and in nature and in physics, the forces need to balance. That's part of what this is all about. In fact, volcanoes in nature shoot smoke rings all the time. They are not perfect circles. Now, we discovered something with this. It's really just a garbage can with some fog in it, right? But does anybody here know what gravitation waves are? Anybody? It's, yeah, I know you two know. <laughs> well, what we figured out, what we figured out is uh, what gravitation waves can be simulated with because what we have right here is an ellipse. I'm going to put this ellipse right here on the front of the garbage can. We were just goofing around in the office, actually. We said, let's try different shapes. So now there's an ellipse here. Well, gravitation waves are how gravity kind of propagates across our universe, but this is a kind of the shape they use. You see that alternating back and forth, quadrupole motion. That's exactly what gravitation waves look like, right? And it's just, hey, we're doing modern physics with a garbage can. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it. By the way, here's a simulation of what a gravitational wave looks like as it propagates to us after two black holes merging with each other. <laughs> Okay, we should switch over. You got the other two. simulation, right? Waves? Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Now, we have to talk a little bit about waves. Uh, we've said some of these words already, but I want to make sure that you understand, have a picture in your head. You can either have sound waves or you can have vibrations on a string or you can have surface waves on the ocean. Waves are all over the way, place. And here's what a wave looks like. They call this a sine wave for a specific shape, but you see it's very regular, okay? It goes up and down and goes positive and negative. And now this one, there's a characteristic distance from one peak to another that's kind of long over here. And there's a characteristic distance from one peak to another that is short over here. So this has a short wavelength, and this has a long wavelength, okay? This one right here, you see it's going around fast, and we say this has high frequency. If you were, and this one has a low frequency. If these were sound waves, this would sound like oh, and this would sound like ee. I know I have perfect pitch. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, at any rate, and they both propagate just like the waves that Dave showed you, but they're regular, they're repeatable, and that occurs in many situations. That was what a wave like this is what Dave shook the, the glass apart with. Now we're going to do it with a rope. Uh, can you turn on the one direction and the other direction? We're going to do the same thing with standing waves on a rope. No, nope. there we go. Start it. Here's a wave on a rope. It's hitting a wall and you see it reflects. It reflects down and the sum of the wave that's reflecting with the wave that's coming in add up to a total and notice that the zeros, <laughs> the zeros and the maximums always stay in the same place. We call that a standing wave like you would get on a guitar if you pluck it holding down. And now here is the first standing wave you can have on a rope. A zero there, and a zero there, and a maximum in the middle. Actually, there's a picture on the uh, PowerPoint slide. And now we turn up the frequency. We make it, make it vibrate faster. The wavelength gets smaller. And now, one half, of a, one, whole, one half of a wavelength, one half of a wavelength, and a zero in the middle. This is what, pencils don't make very good lasers. <laughs> Uh, this is the first one, this is the second one, higher frequency. Now if we go to the, the next highest frequency, we should see this. Zero, zero, one, two, three, maximum. And you can keep on going to higher frequencies. More power. Beam me up, Scotty. Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's as high as we go. So there's a certain number of ways that waves can naturally fit on a certain shape. Okay? Actually, this is the same principle about around which atoms are built. And if you believe the people in the top floor of the physics department in string theory, the entire universe, every particle. Now, I'm here to ask you a very strange question, all right? Let's see if you can answer this question. How big is that sound? How big? Why is that a strange question? How do human beings measure sound? We know if a sound is loud, we know if it's soft, we measure it with decibels, we measure it with our ears. How do you know an elephant is really large? You see it. How do you know a mouse is really small? You see it. But do you see this? No. But here on our show, I'm going to show you just what that looks like. And you know what I'm going to do for that? I'm going to use fire, but you knew that already, right? <laughs> then we put some gas in this tube, and now light the top of the tube, all the way across. And now I'm going to take that flame and go down to a nice, even flame across the top of the tube. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that sound back inside. Because when I do that, you now see the sound. That's the sound. If you could see that sound in the air going in your ears, this is what you would see. That's what that sound wave looks like. Is that pretty? That's kind of fun, right? That's the size of it right there. Up and down and up and down and up and down. And as Mark says, those waves are part of our universe. Now that's just one tone. What if I go higher in frequency, higher in pitch? What happens to the size of the wave? Bigger or smaller? Bigger. What do we do to find out? Try it. So here's our tone. I'm going to go higher. And here it's higher. It's now smaller. And I can go lower. And I go lower. It's now bigger. So you can see the bass notes are a bigger wave. Those high notes, they're a really tiny wave. And you can see that right here. And this is fun, right? But what if I go ahead and put a song in here instead? What might we see? Yeah, we might see all the dancing waves in a song. And I know, I realize, you all have your favorite songs. And you know what? I'm not going to play any one of them. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play a song I think you all may know, especially if you've actually been to a wedding. Let's see if you know this song, all right? in that song. And this is fun stuff. This is how I play my stereo at home. What's wrong with this, right? 
Sometimes a big one, sometimes a small one. But you can see all the dancing waves in that song. And I hope you enjoy this one. It's one of my favorite demonstrations of all time. There you go. And you can you cook go. hot dogs on it. <laughs> you got right to it? Density, right? Yeah, but no, first we're going uh, to do something with density. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got, and this is our uh, helium. This is for you, Mark. Now, have, has anyone here ever actually breathed helium? What happens to your voice when you do that? Well, let Mark show you what that's all about, right there, right? <laughs> Thank you. And I'm not talking like Donald Duck. <laughs> I can't. It does change back, doesn't it? No. <laughs> that's it, you're done. <laughs> so, a lot of us have done that already, right? We breathe the helium, it's a different density than the regular air, so your voice goes higher. But what if I have a gas that's actually more dense? Lower. Not less dense. Lower. What should happen to my voice? Lower. It should go lower. <laughs> and you can tell I like, it's a lot lower, right? I sound like Darth Vader. This is sodium hexafluoride. This is so dense, it makes my voice a lot lower. So the connection with the sound of your voice, as you can tell, the hard part about this is getting it out of my lungs. That's the really tough part, but I'll do it in a second. We have to turn him upside down. <laughs> <laughs> now, and shake him. Hey, as scientists, we all know what water is. Yeah. yeah, we know what water is. Why don't you get the drum over here? We all know what water is. Uh, what's this right here? Pepsi. Regular Pepsi. Do you, have you ever picked up one of those? Yeah. What's this one right here? Have you ever picked up one of those? So all you scientists know what all these things are. Here's water, and here's soda, and here's diet soda. So as scientists, I want you to all tell me. I'm going to take this regular soda. I'm not going to open it. I'm just going to stick the can of soda in the water bath. Does it sink, or does it flow? Sink. Wait a second, I thought you knew this. What will it do? <laughs> what do we do to find out? We'll put it in the water bath, let it go, and it actually goes right to the bottom. <coughs> Diet soda, sick or float? Float, why? Right, because it's all, what kind of theory is that? What will it do? They give you the same amount of soda, they give you the same amount of bubbles. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, you go home and do it. Oh, you want me to do it? You're curious now, and that's exactly what any scientist is. A scientist is just a curious human being. That's all we are. You are scientists all the time. So what will it do in the water bath? Yeah. Now, science isn't just about the experiment. Science is then about why. Why? What do they sweeten that soda at the bottom of the water bath with? Sugar. And there's a lot of sugar in there, and that makes it more dense than water. Here we sweeten this soda with what? Rat poison, I mean aspartame. <laughs> you know they were looking for rat poison when they came up with aspartame? What does that make us? <laughs> the rats, yeah. And you only need a little bit of that powerful chemical to make it as sweet as all that sugar. So that's less dense than water, that's more dense than water. But who here has ever been in a swimming pool? Me too. Who here has ever been in our lovely ocean? Me too. Where do you feel more of a buoyant force lifting you up? Ocean wide, what's in the ocean? Salt, sharks, toilet paper, lots of stuff. So <laughs> if I take some salt and I add it to the water bath, we can bring that soda that used to be at the bottom right to the top. Because sinking and floating is all about relative density. And once the water bath is more dense, it comes right to the surface, just like that. There you go. Now, what floats in our air? Air. Air is, what floats in air is air? Yeah. What floats in air? Yeah, you get a helium balloon for your birthday, right? And we got these two balloons over here. And that green balloon over there, that's a helium balloon. And here's what we're going to do. 
<laughs> we're going to actually <laughs> pop that helium balloon. A little bit. Yeah. And I'll warn you, when I know people are more scared of popping balloons than almost anything else in life. And Mark there, he's got a, uh, a lighter and he's got some matches. Uh, you can light it. I'll so he's going to light that helium two balloon. two things at once. <laughs> but fun facts about helium, and everything I'm going to tell you about helium is true. When he lights that helium balloon right here, what's going to happen is that helium balloon, it's actually, the helium in the balloon is going to come out of this room. It's going to go all the way up to the top of our atmosphere, and then it leaves the Earth. Earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold helium to the Earth. So any helium in the air winds up in outer space. This is all true. And if this is all true, when did human beings first see helium? Never. Never. <laughs> we got it in the balloon. Where do you first see it? On the sun. It's named after the sun. Helium, Helios. That's why it's called what it's called. 1856, an eclipse of the sun. They saw the burning yellow lines of helium. We're going to see that later on in our show today. And they mentioned they named it after our sun. Where do we get our helium from now? And don't say the party store. Where does it come from? Natural gas. We pull the natural gas out of the ground, a whole lot of helium comes with it. But you know what? We're actually running short of helium here on Earth. Yeah, we got a helium shortage. And helium is really important. We use it in MRI machines, lots of other things. So let's send more out to outer space. Okay. <laughs> now there's another gas that floats a whole lot better than helium. We're never, ever, ever, ever going to run out of it. It's really, really cheap. Why don't they give you hydrogen balloons? <laughs> oh, it's better than that. <laughs> now, let's go ahead and look at this. Now, for any of those children in the audience, there's going to be a flash and a boom, and you'll actually feel a bit of a concussion of air, OK? OK, where is the uh, light? OK. You know it's going to be dangerous when they have me do it. We have 40 professors, but we've only got one day. The lighter, the lighter just ran out. Look at that. It's called timing. Another lighter, please. Thank you. Oh, no, we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do it. They keep making it bigger and bigger. <laughs> like, uh, somebody you. has a grudge totally. against me in the back room. <laughs> By the way, this is very, very loud. Okay, everybody ready? Three, two, one. <laughs> what is that balloon floating in? Air. What's inside you? Air. What's inside this drum? But let's take all the air out of this drum. Remember we had that experiment before when we shot the ping pong ball. But what we're going to do, we're going to take all the air out of this drum right here with that vacuum pump now. And what's going to happen is since all the air is not going to be on the inside pressing out, well, that drum then may collapse very violently. And by the way, we have no idea when this is going to happen. We have no idea how violent this is going to be. So don't worry about this at all. Just ignore this, OK? <laughs> And that's up to you. You want to show them this thing here? Which one am I? Uh, these two? Am I starting to talk about that one? You're okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, don't ignore that. <laughs> it's going to go boom sometime, but I don't know when. Now, this is something really important. I want you to teach you something Grab my water. that you can remember all your life that a lot of people don't realize. Uh, I've got two simulated gases here. Can somebody tell me what's the difference between the molecule motion here and the molecule motion here? Faster. This one's moving faster and this one's moving. Oh, and you see now that this is very low temperature. And you see that this is very high temperature. So the next time somebody tells you what the temperature is, what they are really telling you is what's the average speed of the molecules. That's not it. <laughs> 
pay no attention. Uh, <laughs> what's the average speed or the average energy per molecule of motion? Okay, that's what temperature is. Nothing more. Okay, at least for an ideal gas, but we won't get into that. Okay. All right. So now we know what temperature is. Now. This pressure is very high, and these are like baseballs hitting the side walls very fast. And so they push on the walls very hard, just like atmospheric pressure is pushing on the outside of this. Okay, 14.7 pounds per square inch. And here, they bounce off the walls very weakly, so the pressure is very small. So the pressure, like the temperature, is sort of a measure of the average speed of a molecule inside the can. So those fancy big things they call thermodynamic quantities, uh, uh, pressure and temperature, are just measures of microscopic little speeds of motion. Okay, it still hasn't gone yet. Here you go. Oh, yeah. well, I got one more thing. Oh. If we turn on, there's no gravity here. Turn on gravity here. Uh, gravity is, uh, yeah, turn it, yeah. You see what happens? Now, you see most of the molecules are down here at the bottom when you turn on gravity, and there's not so many at the top, and the ones that are moving at the top are moving slowly, and the ones that are moving at the bottom are moving fast. That means it's warm at the bottom and cold at the top. You know this, right? Have you ever gone up a tall mountain? It's cold on the top, it's warm on the bottom. If you go up too tall a mountain, it's hard to breathe because there aren't very many molecules up there. So you now understand that concept in terms of the detail underlying principles, okay? Remember that, it's all simple. It can be made mysterious. But we can also move air. I'll turn that on and give that to Mark. Okay. And now I got a beach ball. It's going to sit right inside that airflow right there. And the beach ball stays right there. Very, very, very stable, right? And it's so stable, Mark can really kind of move it around, and it still stays in that airflow. Doesn't want to leave the airflow. Very happy to be right there, right? I can even kind of push on the side a little bit, and it still stays there. So it's very stable in the airflow, right? Oh, there's a button. Oh, yeah, there's another button. All right. <laughs> so you can see that. Now, oh. <laughs> I have to go change my underwear. I'll be right back. <laughs> that scare anybody? That's a very loud, violent implosion. You can see just how much force of air is all on us all around. It took a steel drum and pushed it crushed it with all that force. The only reason the steel drum could hold out before, all that air, like Mark's simulation, was inside there, pushing out. You take that air out, and no longer will it be pushing enough uh, to hold that air pressure out, okay? It collapses thing. like this. But what happens if I pull this off of here right now? Is that big drum gonna re-expand? A, a slide after No, that. just like a beer can I crushed in my head last night. It's not going to reopen anytime soon, right? So that's what we have right there. A heavy steel drum can be crushed by air pressure, just like that. By the way, here's the picture that you remember we had, we had the floating ball? That's called the Bernoulli ball because it's a Bernoulli effect. And it means it occurs when the fast moving air has a very uh, high pressure and slow moving air has a very low pressure. And so whenever it tries to fall off, there's a little push here, there's a rather a high pressure here, and this is low pressure. And so it always, no matter which way it tries to fall off, it gets pushed back in. Now, if you want to go into New York City on a train and you want to predict something for somebody next to you, when, the when you hit the tunnel going out into New York City Penn Station, the velocity of the air on the outside of the train changes because it drags against the walls. So if the pressure changes, and your ears pop. And so you turn to the person next to you and say, hey, your ears are going to pop at about, right about now. And you can predict it. It's the same effect. Oh, yes, this one, you know, I get carried away, as you may tell. Uh, let's try this one. Oh!
I don't want to bounce anybody on the head. So that high velocity of air is low pressure, but all around is non-moving air that's very high pressure. Always pushing the beach ball into where that pressure is moving. But I can actually use this too. Let's see what we can do with this, because I can go oh, ahead. Yeah, I can hold it. The pile of toilet paper right off the wall, like this. <laughs> With all that fast moving air. And in physics, we use a lot of toilet paper, so. And they wonder why. <laughs> now you know. It's not the reason you thought. <laughs> You can keep any toilet paper you want. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that uh, wave thing on the PowerPoint side, I think. Oh, no, no, you're wrong. Uh, I was wrong. You're right. Uh, it, it's the, um, it's, yeah. There you go. Okay, we were talking about, we were talking about waves before. And we're talking about waves on the ocean, we're talking about uh, waves in the air, we were talking about waves on a string. It turns out one of the most important waves in the universe is light, light waves. And light waves is an electric field that oscillates up and down. I'll just give me a second here. And you can see here the wavelength, the bright and the dark is the maximums and the minimums of the wave. You see here it's a long wavelength, but when it enter enters glass, the wavelength shortens. And also the light bends. Some of it reflects, but some of it bends. And so it, when it slows down inside of a piece of glass, it, the light bends. And here we have an example of this. This is uh, an old favorite of mine because I dumpster dough for this piece of equipment. The particle physics people were throwing it away. I saw it at a dumpster. I jumped in the dumpster and pulled it out. It's smaller than it used to be because I've dropped it since then, but <laughs> the uh, machine shop very kindly fixed it. Okay, so Dave's going to shine. A, we're going to turn out the lights and we're going to put this on here. And you can see the light reflecting off the top surface. And now watch how you see how the light comes in and how it bends when it goes inside. Can you see that bend? Okay, so light bends when it, go, when it goes into a medium in which it slows down. Now you can also do the following. You can also do what we call total internal reflection. And here's an example of total internal reflection. The light comes in here, and you can see right here in the center it reflects off and always stays inside the block. That's called total internal reflection. That's what happens in the optical fibers that carry your internet. You get some reflection from this surface over here and some transmission over here, but this is the total internal reflection. Uh, here you go. Actually, well, I, I'll, I've got a story on my own about that that I think I'll skip. <laughs> I, the adults in the room, I can tell you a story. It's about inspecting your insides. Uh, uh, this, you see, this, the, the special thing about this block is that when you hit it with high energy ultraviolet light, that it fluoresces. And so the particle physics used to Just use like it that. when particles went through, they'd leave a little glowing trail, very much like that laser, except the laser was scattering. Uh, and what else do we have here? Oh, uh, yes. Now, here we have. Yeah, this is a violet laser. And by the way, uh, one piece of advice about lasers. Uh, you always treat them like they're dangerous, okay? Uh, these guys should be of the proper power. Uh, if you have a violet laser, you can draw on a fluorescent material. We'll put a little horn on it. That's Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this <laughs> one over here, and now open it up. Oh, you gotta hold that other part up so I'm not so close to your face. Okay. What is that? That's a glow in the dark toilet seat. You appreciate that more and more as you get older. <laughs> Especially in the middle of the night. 
Now, I want to show you something that's very important here. It turns out that the violet is a much higher energy radiation than the green, and the green is much more intense, but it doesn't light. It doesn't have enough energy to kick the electrons out of the molecules so that it fluoresces long afterwards, phosphoresces, I should say. Okay, so that's some properties of, of light. There you go. Now we're going to actually have you use those glasses. Could you get those glasses out from before? Take those glasses out. If you need a pair of glasses, let us know because more, we have more to give you. They are our gift to you. And when is the last time Rutgers gave you something for free? It's been a long time, right? Actually, we usually do a temperature now, but we can do this. Let's keep it on light. That's good. So first thing I'd like you to do, oh, let's make sure. There we go. Let's look at that light bulb right there. We can turn the lights out. What do you see when you look at that light bulb right there? Rainbows. And we all like rainbows, don't we? Right? The rainbows on one side, rainbows on the other side, and now it's what we got. What color is on one side of the rainbow? Red. What color is on the other side of the rainbow? Purple, violet, indigo. For some reason, we call that color lots of things. We're going to call it violet, okay? So we go from red to violet, and all the colors in between are what we can see as human beings. And you use those glasses, and those glasses are diffraction gratings. They're used in science every single day. And we'll show you how. Because uh, what we're going to do is show you this chemical right here. Oh, thanks. What do you see when you look through the glasses at that light right there? What color comes out the most? Uh, actually, it's the red. It's that red. That's the most fa famous emission line in the entire universe. That's hydrogen gas being tickled by electrical discharge, and 80% of the universe is hydrogen. And that's called the red bomber line for hydrogen, the most famous wavelength in the universe. Now we're going to move on to the next one. This is a different chemical. What color do you see there? That's that yellow. This is helium. This is what they saw on the sun. They, before they knew anything about helium, they first saw this. And they said, hey, let's try to find this here on Earth. And they did. But that's when we first saw helium on the sun. Okay, we saw those lines. And now we're going to change this gas too. We're going to go to a different gas. I'm going to turn this one on. What do you see there? Ah, but that's also, that's mercury, right? So that gives us those specific colors. Every single element has its very own fingerprints. And you can see the fingerprints of mercury. You're going to turn on that light. Because that actually has mercury in it. And some of the same colors are in that light and inside that spectrum that's below it. It's kind of fun to see those squiggly bulbs too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you can really be a scientist all around your house. You really can with those glasses, and you really should be. Let's look at this one right here. This one's actually a whole lot of fun, too. This is actually everybody's favorite, usually. What do you see there? All those lines. That's neon. That's from a neon sign. Yeah, it does, right? That's what they use. They use neon. That's a neon laser. So that's exactly what I have. But use those glasses all around your house. Be a scientist with those glasses. Look at all your holiday lights with those glasses. That's a whole lot of fun, right? Look at all the lights in maybe in New York City at night. You know, my favorite thing with those glasses is to look at a full moon. A full moon is spectacular. A beautiful continuous spectrum. Nothing better than that. At the same time, never look at the sun with your bare eyes or with those glasses. That's really dangerous. But now, let's see how much fun we can have with these glasses. Because here's what I'm going to do. We turn on this light. Because this shows you what those glasses do. You take your heads, you go side to side. It's like a bird flying, isn't it? Yeah. Be a scientist with those glasses. It really is a lot of fun. Let me show you just how much fun we can have with these glasses, OK? What do you see there? What happens as these lights change color? You see color mixing in action. Yeah, you can see what each one of those colors is made from as this shifts through its different colors. 
Is that pretty? You can use those glasses on your phones. Put them in, in front of the lens on your phone. You can take pictures of spectra all around. So be a scientist with the tool we just gave you, OK? So we're going to do the go. temperature, right? Uh, yeah, let's yeah, do that quickly. Right OK, we're going back to that one there. If you look at this, that's a very hot light. And you see it has all the colors of the rainbow. Now if we turn down the temperature, turn down the electricity to it, you'll see it disappear from one end. Crack it. It disappears from the blue. The high energy, the high energy disappears first and it looks redder as you turn down the temperature. So you can tell the temperature of any object if you look at it through a telescope with uh, diffraction gratings like you have on your eyes right now. Okay, we can now put on the screen. You got, you have, that's right, for, it for you, right, Dave? Yeah. Okay, this is just, whoa. Oh, that's because I have the diffraction grading glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it, if you go out at night uh, after sunset, the Orion constellation, I believe, is about there now. And the Orion constellation has three belt stars. And one of the belts, of th what, the, the upper hand of Orion right here, Beautiful. You, what color is that? That's reddish. That's because it's a cold star. It's a cold star about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. These other stars here are very hot, 11,000 degrees Kelvin. These are hot young stars. This is a red old star. Uh, and you can see the spectrum. That's the, if you do, what you get out of the diff uh, diffraction grating. The distribution of colors has lots of red for this, but for these guys, they're over tilted over here towards the blue. Now, if you go down here to the sword of Orion and you look at the center of it, there's a cloud of glowing gas right there. And this is what you see, and what is that? Red, and what's the most famous line in the universe? Hydrogen. The red line of hydrogen. This is a glowing gas cloud, a hot cloud lit up by newly born stars that's glowing in with hydrogen. Okay, and so this is the way, this is, this is the basis of a great deal of astronomy right here as we look all around the universe and we look at the detailed colors that the different stars are sending us. All right, now we're going to look at that heat a little again, a little, a little bit. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is we're going to use a camera right here, because okay. we did show you ultra, uh, that ultraviolet before. But what I have right here is a camera that actually can show us what you all look like in infrared. <laughs> because this right here is you. Yeah, wave, when's the last time you saw yourself in infrared, right? And you know what?
What's that? Broccoli, yes. <laughs> now, I used to not like broccoli so much, and then my wife started making it with garlic, and it's fantastic. You can even you can even barbecue it; it's even better. Now, here is another thing that emphasizes why you don't want to touch this stuff, and. This is a hot dog, <laughs> a little bit like a finger. And when it gets this cold, it gets very brittle, which is why you don't want to expose yourself to liquid nitrogen temperatures very long. If you're quick, you can do it briefly. Now this one comes to us courtesy of United Fruit. <laughs> What's that? What's that? A banana split, right? <laughs> it's a difficult night way to make one. Oh, and then we can do a flower. Let's do a little flower. Flower becomes oh, yes. extreme. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a little while to cool. Let's see if that's good enough. It becomes brittle as glass. Okay, now this, this demonstration is one of my favorites. Remember I showed you that simulation? Uh, a high temperature gas, what's really going on? Anybody remember? What are the molecules doing? They're moving fast, high energy of motion, right? At low temperature gas, they're moving slow, low energy of motion. And when they're moving fast, they create a high pressure. And when they're moving slow, they create a low pressure. Now, here I have helium. If I let go of this, it would float up to the ceiling. So what I'm going to expose it to liquid nitrogen, and I'm going to start slowing down the molecules. They're, they have less energy of motion. I'm taking the energy of motion out and putting it in the, and it's shrinking. The pressure is dropping because they're not hitting the wall as hard, okay? but it's the same amount of matter inside it, so the density of the thing is increasing. And so if I do this enough, its density will become greater than the density of air and it won't float anymore. But then it starts warming up again. They start moving faster, and as they move faster, the bag expands. No, no, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> Let it go. And it floats back up to the ceiling. Uh, the, the helium will diffuse out in a few days and it will come down on its own. Here you got this right here. Oh, yes. We call this our liquid nitrogen cannon because there's liquid li nitrogen in here which turns to a gas and when you stop it, the gas has no place to go and so it wants to explode out. Watch out! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I made it to the back row. All right. <laughs> One more. Maybe I'll. <laughs> Put this up. Okay. Now, this one always reminds me of my father because he worked in a nitroglycerin factory in Morristown in the 1930s. And they had three strong walls on a, his laboratory and one weak wall, and that was a blowout wall. Because then they'd sweep, they'd build a new wall, sweep up all the glass, and hire a new guy. <laughs> if you're going to work with explosives, you want to have a blowout wall, by the way. Okay, where are we? Oh, right. Faraday effect. Okay. This is the Faraday lecture uh, because Michael Faraday in the 1820s used to give the Christmas lecture uh, every year at the Royal Society. And we didn't want to call it the Dave and Mark show. That would be too low, too low brow. <laughs> so we named it after Faraday who did it first, the children's lecture. And uh, he was very meticulous and he wanted to see, he thought there was a connection between magnetism and flowing electricity. And so he built a separate room to put his wire in. And he'd go into the room and he'd very carefully put the magnet in the, into the coil and he'd go in another room and he'd look at his magnetometer there that my hand is blocking and nothing happened. 
until one day he put it in a little bit loosely and he walked into the other room and while I was, when he got there, it fell out. And he suddenly realized the change in the magnetic field is what makes electricity work, flow in the circle. So if you go like this, or like this, any time it changes, or if you make a dynamo in which you rotate it, you make electricity flow back and forth, and if you put it on a paddle wheel, you've got a turbine, uh, a hydroelectric generator, okay? <laughs> so that's the Faraday effect. Those are your ramps down the incline there. Okay. Changing magnetic fields make electricity flow. There's another way you can change a magnetic field. You can take something that's made of metal with electrons that are free to move, and you can run it through a magnetic field. And when you do, the energy goes into the motion of the electrons and comes out of the rolling of this, and you see it's like hitting butter. Okay? So you've co converted mechanical energy into energy of electricity. You can even show this one's all milled out on the inside, but it has a contiguous path for electricity to flow in a circle, so you still see the same effect. Okay, Cir circular motion of electricity when the magnetic field changes. This guy is milled, cut very little, but it's cut from this side, and then cut from this side, and then cut from this side, so that nothing can flow in a circle. And so it's immune to the changing magnetic field effect. And he goes through as if he's not there. Now, the next thing you can do is you can say, OK, uh, if it's flowing electrical current that creates this, let's cool the thing off, and the atoms slow down, and the electricity flows better. And so you get the effect on steroids. A big effect. Now, did you all notice there it went through and it sped up for just a little bit? That's because it was symmetrical and it had the, there was no changing magnetic field. It wasn't coming in or going out. It was right in the middle. Okay. Now here we have these shapes going through the magnet. But here I have a very powerful magnet, okay, which can move. And here the material isn't going to move. But that effect still works. And this is a big copper tube. And this is a very powerful magnet. But it's copper magnetic. <coughs> no, and if I put this magnet next to the copper tube and let it go, it just falls. Right? It doesn't attach itself. Here, that steel bar wants to stay there. But it doesn't really want to stay attached to the copper. But I can use this copper tube. And you can look down it with our screen. I'm going to let that go. Whoa. What do you see happen to the magnet? Oh, yeah. So now we're moving the magnet and leaving the solution, right, leaving that material right there, whereas the up one Mark was showing you was just the opposite, but the effect is still the same. You want to see it again? Yeah. Of course you do. It's like an astronaut falling through space, right? Really quite interesting. So that's what we have with, with that movement of the magnet. Works just the same as the movement of the material. There's no real difference. By the way, we got this tube. Uh, from Tim, Tim Coates, he brought it from Fermi Laboratory. It's just a piece of wire, except it carried so much electricity they had to send water down the center of it to cool it from the inside to keep it from melting. Okay, they couldn't cool it from the outside because it would have we'll melted first. Okay, so now we're going to now do a different, the same, same effect, except now we have a alternating uh, electric uh, current it goes this way, and so magnetic field points up, and then it reverses and goes the other way, and magnetic field points down. It does this 60 times a second. So there's a constantly changing magnetic field when we turn on the electrical current. And so if I put this guy on here like this, and I send through the uh, current, it's called the ring flinger. Actually, I used to have a child come up, and I'd say, OK, could you put this on here for me like this? And, they, and I had to hand it to them, and they'd try to tr <laughs> I'd turn it on, and they'd go. <laughs> and, I'd, and then I'd take it from them, turn it off, and say, no, no, you put it on like this, OK? <laughs> They've advised me to stop doing that. <laughs> Torturing children. <laughs> yes, yes. At any rate, uh, so and, it, and they, I usually ask them if they felt something. They said it's getting warmer. The heating of the electricity is just like on the uh, induction stove that you may have in some of your houses. 
Now, the other thing is to make sure it's going in a circle and you see this object that has a cut in it so no electricity can flow in a circle and nothing happens. Of course, the children don't trust me at all then. I have to show them I'm really turning it on because the one that's solid jumps and the one that's not doesn't. Now, finally, if we want to have it really jump, we lower its resistivity and make current flow better. And so I have liquid nitrogen on this one and we should get the effect on steroids. <laughs> okay, uh, be careful. <laughs> you need your fingerprints. <laughs> okay, now the other thing, the last thing you want to do with this is say, well, how do I really know it's electricity that's uh, flowing in these things? And the answer is you light a light bulb with it. It's just like taking this one right here and putting a light bulb across a gap. But to make the effect bigger, we wind the wire lots of times and put a, a light bulb in. And I can light a light bulb without any touching. This is, of course, a transformer. It changing current here makes, uh, induces electricity here. And it passes the energy back and forth with changing magnetic fields. Now, it's been a long show for Mark, so we're going to let him lie down for a while. But I need two people to help me with my next demonstration. No one ever wants to volunteer. I hate yeah. this. You and you. Come on down. We're going to let Mark lie down. What are we going to let Mark down? You come on over here. You come on over here, young ladies, right over here. That's OK. Because what we got Mark to lie down on is a bed of nails. And uh, yeah, we like Mark that much. <laughs> And so now what I'm going to do is pick that up I'm on the side. Come on, Mark. <laughs> and Mark's going to lie down right here on our bed of nails. Right here. It's not going to hurt. Yeah, oh, right. yeah? You want to take my place? <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> He's going to lie down right here. He moves slower every year. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> And now what we have is another bed of nails. We're going to put nails down on Mark. Don't you move. You're going to be right here. You're going to be just safe right here. Come on on the back side. Come on over on this side. Come over on this side. And now my two new friends here get to go ahead and stand right on Mark. <laughs> no dancing. So Mark is now in between two beds of nails with two human beings on him. How about a big round of applause for Mark? Did I forget to mention no jumping? <laughs> wait, 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 my hands. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You got it? You got it? So yeah. yeah, dropping. You got to let go. Let go. Let go. <laughs> Thanks for our volunteers. Thank you both so much. Now, Mark still is relatively okay. But we don't do this because it's magic. We don't want magic, we want physics, right? So let's explain what we did here because I got, what I got right here is something really similar to Mark. Thin skin and filled with hot air. And you know, yeah. And um, <laughs> hey, guess what? If I had a bed of nails with only one nail and Mark put this 200 pounds on that one nail, how many pounds of force on the one nail? 200, but what if my bed of nails had 10 nails? How many pounds of force on each nail? But what if my bed of nails had 100 nails? How many pounds of force on each nail? Two, and that's enough, that's not enough to go through Mark's skin. You actually need 12 pounds of force on a nail to go through human skin. Hey, I'm a scientist, I did the experiment. It, was a it took day. a lot of professors but to I did the experiment. So, this is Mark, and here's a bed of nails with lots of nails. Will this balloon bust on all those nails? What do we do to find out? That's how you really learn. And if I put that on there and I push, it doesn't bust the balloon. There's not enough force in any one nail. Here's a bed of nails with half as many nails. What's that do to the force? Doubles it. Will it bust this time? No. You put maybe on test. What do we do to find out? And no. Here we have a bed of nails with half as many again. Will it bust this time? This is also our last one. Will it bust this time? Yeah. That's how you do multiple choice tests too, isn't it? Yeah. On A, it's not B. Hey, nailed it. Now, our last demonstration for this, I need our sign again. What's that sign say? Yeah. 
That Physics Show. We've been running for over 620 shows in Manhattan. Come and see us if you'd like this, what you see right here today. I'm going to put it right here on Mark's neck. It looks just like a guillotine too, right? Now, here's the next part of our experiment. A cinder block. And what are we going to do? Yeah, you stay there. You stay there. We're going to put it right here on Mark's rock hard ass. <laughs> and now, we got a sledgehammer. Because here's our experiment. Bed and nails, Mark, brick, sledgehammer. Does Mark live? What do we do to find out? Do the experiment. Three, two, one. Bust the brick. And Mark is perfectly fine. A big round of applause for Mark. Yeah.